Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches and today I am going to be talking about the 1964 alien monster movie The Creeping Terror. Uh, and the film starts with the sheriff, his deputy Martin, who's also his nephew, uh, and the deputy's wife all investigating a reported plane crash. But the vessel that landed here is no ordinary aeroplane, it is in fact a spacecraft. A spacecraft, it turns out, from which a strange, crawling, slug-like monster has already emerged. Now, the sheriff enters the ship and is promptly consumed by a second monster, which at this stage remains off-screen, and Deputy Martin decides that discretion is a better part of valour and calls in the assistance of the military. Uh, the call is answered by a special unit under the command of one Colonel Caldwell, uh, and is soon joined by uh, Dr. Bradford, who is described as the world's leading authority on space emissions. Whatever that means. Together, uh, these two men will head up the authorities' efforts to understand the craft and its remaining occupant, while also trying to hunt down the original beast, which is now rampaging. Uh, if you have a very broad definition of rampaging, as we will get to shortly, around the local area, consuming everyone it encounters. Can these alien monstrosities be stopped? Will any human being in this movie show an ounce of common sense or self-preservation? Will you care? Only one of these questions has an affirmative answer. So this film is also known as The Crawling Monster, uh, which shows the kind of imagination um, that uh, the movie's deeply stupid characters would be proud to call their own. Uh, the tale of how the movie came to be is actually far more interesting than the story the film depicts. Uh, it's even been turned into a movie of its own, 2014's The Creep Behind the Camera. Uh, but here's a brief overview of the story behind the movie. This film was produced and directed by, and stars, one Vic Savage. Or at least, that's the name we're going to use for him here. Uh, it appears to be one of numerous aliases, but since we don't, have, don't, know, don't know his real name, it'll do as well as any other. The man calling himself Savage apparently attracted investors for the project, some of them contributing as little as a few hundred dollars, by offering them parts in the film and a share of the profits. Now this didn't prove a particularly successful as an inducement, uh, and Savage ran out of money on several occasions, which, as you might imagine, was something of a problem for production. At one point, things got so bad that the special effects lead stole the main monster costume in an attempt to force Savage to pay him his overdue salary. Now, Savage would become the subject of multiple legal actions, uh, possibly including fraud charges, uh, and before the movie was even released, he pulled a vanishing act to escape these legal woes. Uh, it was left to his main financier, who had played the significant on-screen role of Dr. Bradford, to try and pull up some kind of product together and recoup some of the investment. Uh, now, the resulting film f fails on every level as a work of fiction or of entertainment, but it is fascinating in the varied ways that it finds to fail. So, let's dig into those. And begin where the movie does, with narration. Uh, Wikipedia indicates that the movie may have been shot without regard to sound quality, with the dialogue intended to be dubbed in afterwards, or possibly that the original audio, uh, which would have been st stored on separate media to the visuals, was lost. Um, now, whichever it was, it's certainly possible to record new dialogue in post-production. Many films do this where the original audio proves murky or there's unexpected noise. Uh, but you know, to re-record all of the dialogue for a whole movie would be quite time-consuming and expensive. And as previously noted, money was something the production didn't have. Savage's solution, or possibly his investors, the timeline is a little unclear, was to hire a radio announcer to provide narration for pretty much the entire film. So what we see on screen is, is actors acting, including obviously speaking to one another, but we don't hear anything very often. Most of the time, all we hear is the narrator droning, droning on and on and on to explain what it is that they're saying to each other. So he'll tell us, Martin said such and such a thing, or Martin told them, or they agreed that this would happen. And this would be bad enough by itself, but then the baffling decision was made to keep what small bits of dialogue were still available and us usable, literally leading to a moment where the narrator tells us Martin was introduced to Dr. Bradford, and then we hear the guy on screen say, Martin, this is Dr. Bradford. What uh, they were thinking is really beyond imagination. 
Now, let's talk about the monster, or monsters, because there are two of them, but in a cunning act of cinematic and financial genius, they are identical and never on the screen at the same time. My word, the Machiavellian brilliance of these filmmakers is breathtaking. But anyway, the monster. It's a kind of slug or caterpillar-like thing, which you know isn't a bad idea as a starting point for a creature. Many people find creepy crawlies like that quite unpleasant, and a very large one would probably be quite scary. Uh, unfortunately, while the concept might be okay, the execution is an utter failure. Uh, it's clearly you know, a couple of guys underneath a canopy. Think of a like a new Chinese New Year's festival and the dragon dancers there, but remove all of the grace and speed. No, no, all of the, you're imagining too much grace and speed being left. You have to dial it down. Keep dialing it down again and again and again. And have you got to the point where a, a one-legged person could hop away faster than this thing moves? If so, you're in the right ballpark. There are literally scenes in this film where people walk away from the creeping terror and outpace it. They don't walk hurriedly, they don't run, they don't, you know, move like they've got a purpose, they just kind of amble away. Now, of course, then they find out that, you know, they've reached a door or something, and they apparently can't remember how doorknobs work, so they get eaten. Uh, many others don't even bother to run, they just kind of let the monster slowly ooze over them without making any attempt to save themselves. If you've seen Austin Powers and the like the incredibly long scene where he very slowly runs down a, a bad guy minion while the guy just stands there and screams and screams and screams and screams for ages without making any attempt to save himself. It's like that, but not played for laughs. Like I said, characters in this movie are phenomenally stupid. Now, ultimately, it turns out the monsters aren't even that tough. Uh, they are admittedly resistant to bullet from handguns and rifles, uh, but the first is taken out with a grenade, while the second is squished by a car. Unstoppable rampaging machines of death, these are not. So they're a failure, even as a threat, even if we ignore how little of a threat they actually are. Now, there are many other aspects of this film that I could complain about, pretty much all of them, in fact. Uh, but I'll restrict myself to just mentioning the last of the film's trifecta of things that are even more stupid than the rest of the movie. Uh, this is a scene where the help narrator advises us that the monster is en route to the local dance hall, where it will interrupt a real hootenanny. And yes, the film narration uses that word. Now, the monster arrives at the dance hall a full seven minutes later. That is seven minutes of shots of people dancing and shots of the monster shuffling across the landscape and basically nothing else. Not even the narrator yammering on and on like he normally does. There's exactly one line of dialogue in the entire seven minute sequence and even that has nothing to do with the plot. Now maybe seven minutes doesn't sound like a long time to you but it's about the length of this video. We're about eight minute mark now. Imagine restarting this video turning off the sound and then just kind of watching the screen until you get to the end. If you're shuddering at the thought, then congratulations, you have some idea of the tedium I endured through this scene. The Creeping Terror is a bad, bad film, but I have to admit that there's a kind of sick fascination for me in its blithe disregard for all the rules of both filmmaking and storytelling. It takes real cuts par to get things this thoroughly wrong. Next time. Ben Stiller's absurdist fashionista comedy Zoolander from 2001. I do hope that, that there won't be any freak gasoline fight accidents. But that's next time. Until then, thanks for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it.